look around. Wow. Some freedom loving people in here tonight. So glad you're here. What a blessing it is to have you here. I want to introduce myself. My name is John Randall. I actually have the privilege of pastoring here at Calvary South OC. And um, we're so glad that you're here. I'm, I'm humbled and I'm blessed to live in the greatest country in this world, the United States of America. And as a Christian, I do believe that God calls us to be good citizens. And included in that, within that calling, is that the church is to be salt and light. We are to be the preserving influence that will impact the country with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And listen, we see the writing on the wall. You know what's going on. That's why you're here. We live in a world of misinformation. And so to help us understand a little bit more, I'm excited tonight to have with us a man that's a Christian. He's a husband. He's a father. And he's also the founder and president of Turning Point USA. Really doesn't need much introduction. Come on, Charlie Kirk, my friend. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Great turnout, All right. man. Yeah, All right. Oh, what a blessing. Thank you so much for coming, Charlie. We're, we're blessed to have you here. And, um, you know, last time we were together, it was in 2020. And uh, we were there in San Juan. And let's face it, a lot has happened since 2020. And first of all, um, the last time we were together, you had just got married. But now you are a father. And my question to you is how has being a father changed your life and impacted the work that you're doing with Turning Point USA. Well, well, thank you, John. And how great is Pastor John, by the way? Does he not do a great job? I'll tell you. And I love this church, and I can see you guys have big, big plans to keep on growing. I remember the, the old spot you have, and <laughs> yeah. uh, I just love it. I, I love this church, and Michelle, you guys do such a great job. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's changed everything. Um, you know, the best way I could analogize it is it's kind of like the Old Testament and the New Testament of your life, uh, it's like BC and AD. It's like you don't even, you don't even, it's like a different chapter of your life mm -hmm. before you have a child. Getting married is, of course, the most important thing mm -hmm. uh, besides giving your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, I will say, though, that the transformation that occurs uh, when uh, you hold your child, um, if you, you get exactly what I mean. Uh, and if you don't, then uh, get married and have kids uh, because it's, it's good for you and good for society. Um, but also, I mean, I will say this. Um, it radicalizes me in the best possible ways. Mm -hmm. And I inherently have difficulty and I pray for forgiveness over this for the kind of bitterness I have towards like the childless that are trying to ruin our society. People that don't have children mm -hmm. and people that don't want us to have children. And they're telling you that we shouldn't have kids because of climate change or you know, we should just have more abortions in our country. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest gift from the Lord to have children. And yeah, it, we should celebrate that every yeah. single day. That's right. It's not easy. You worry about things you've never thought you'd worry about before. And I mean, but you realize that life is not about you. Mm. And that, that is the Christian calling is that it's the unraveling of you and it's focusing on Christ and focusing on the cross, focusing on duty and obligation and obedience. And you realize that you want to try to pass that down to somebody else or a different generation. And then not as if I needed more urgency, <laughs> but it created a, let's say, a higher level of a sense of urgency. And I was like, wow, we're handing down an increasingly awful place to live for my daughter. We're destroying the greatest nation ever to exist in the history of the world. We're doing it to ourselves. And I'm not going to be able to look her in the eyes when she's 10 years old or 15 years old and she'll say like, what was America like when we didn't have, you know, like all the different, you know, open borders or what, did we used to have a country that was considered to be great? Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. And I think you feel the same way um, because that's why we're in this fight. That's right. we're, in, we're in this fight for our children mm -hmm. and God willing, our grandchildren. And so uh, it's blessed Erica and I immeasurably. Um, and if you think you've seen uh, Charlie Kirk work hard, we're going to a whole nother level. Uh, that's what fatherhood does for you. I love that. 
You know, Charlie, I recently saw an interview that you had with Russell Brand. It's been seen by over a million people. I mean, this thing is just, and he asked you a question, and I thought it was a great question, and the way that you answered it was, was excellent. Can you share about how important your relationship with Jesus Christ is as your Savior? Yeah, I mean, it's everything, and we must always keep our eyes focused on the cross. And, you know, when I visit these college campuses, uh, by the way, keep us in prayer. Tomorrow, I'm going to San Diego State University for two events. And so, <laughs> I, I, somebody recently said, Charlie, would you like to go on a mission trip for me? I'm good. <laughs> I've done, an, I, I, I love the mission work. I do my mission work here domestically on college campuses. Yeah. Uh, so, when, when, I go, when I go to San Diego State University, you know, they'll ask me, what makes Christianity different? There's all these different religions and who's to say that yours is correct or right? And, you know, appealing to reason usually doesn't always work right. in that moment. It has to be a soul thing. It has to have transformation from within. But it, it, it needs to be expressed that Christianity is the only faith that expresses where the divine took the temporal form, not out of any sort of, the only explanation could be love. It's the greatest love story ever told. Mm -hmm which is, and this is why John 1 is so incredibly important, and the book of John is transformational, uh, because it is the clearest about Christ's divinity. Um, the, the, Christ's divinity is expressed in all, all gospels, but it is by far the clearest in John, the seven I am statements, and then just John 1, that in the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh, that is so deep and heavy. If you think about, it, it, the word in Greek is logos, and I'm sure Pastor John has walked you through this multiple times, but understanding what that meant in ancient Greek was that it was the, the, the idea that the universe has an inf infinite component to it. The, all of the stars, all of the um, constellations, the logos is the idea that we have gravity and physics and it's the power that made that all come together from our DNA, from how you are perfectly and wonderfully made. The, the Greeks said the logos is the mind of the universe, if you will, the best way I could put it, is the designer. And what John says so clearly is that the Logos then became human. And so let's contrast that with Buddhism. So in Buddhism, it is all about how dirty you as a human being are and that you must shed your dirtiness as a human being to reach nirvana. If you talk to a true Buddhist, they, would, they, they think it is incomprehensible that the divine or the eternal would ever take human form. Like, why would the perfect ever become the dirty human? Mm. They, they just, they don't get it. He said that we're supposed to become eternal by not talking and by, literally in Buddhism, not talking is one of the highest levels of climbing towards nirvana. And only the Buddha ascend in their belief system did that. Christianity flips it all over. It's that, that God loved you so much that he took human form. And that, 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 is, a, that is a truth that resonates to all people. And we, we were joking around about John 3, you know, uh, backstage, but it said right there uh, when Nicodemus is basically questioning Jesus, and this is where we get the idea of being born again, where Nicodemus is like, what do you mean you're born again? Aren't you already, you're born once out of your mother's womb? And Jesus is like, no, you must be born both by water and spirit, water being baptism, spirit being by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And only those will then come into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? Like, God bless this guy, right? He's trying to figure this out. And that's where we get the most famous verse in all of Christianity, for God so loved the world uh, that he gave him one, his one only son that whoever believed in him shall not perish, but he have eternal life. And the next verse that he, he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so this is a rescue mission. Understand that we are in peril because of our own broken, selfish nature. God gave us the ability to choose and we messed it up since the garden. And we, we have not done very well since. War, famine, destruction, yeah. disease, self-interest, murder, rape. And God sees all of humanity and he says, I love humanity so much, I'm gonna give them one last eternal chance mm. and I'm going to take their form. Not just broadcast it on billboards and say, give all your money to me and all this, but I'm going to walk, uh, walk alongside of you and among you. And so Jesus Christ is the most important thing in my life and it's transformed me from within. Uh, and I, I get the amazing opportunity to dialogue with people of all different faiths. And you know, without picking on you know, different uh, religions, you know, let's just say like the new age Eastern religions, they're always grappling with this idea of like, I have to strip myself of all the earthly things and you know, if I just kind of get my um, chakra right, then I'll be able to get to enlightenment. Like you're thinking way too much about this, like this is Jesus is the answer. 
That's mm -hmm. it. It's accepting Jesus into your soul. Yeah. That is the answer yeah. in your life. And then the Greeks had a word for this, which is metamuphe, which is to metamorphosize you. And, and I know you guys have a men's conference coming up in Romans 12 too, which is do not conform to the ways of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the same word renewal or revitalization or metamorphosis, which metamorphosis we think of kind of a caterpillar, caterpillar into a butterfly. That's what happens with Jesus, is that you don't even remember who you once were. And then it's not that you don't sin, but for real Christians, you know what I mean, is that when you sin, you feel differently. And that's my number one mark of how I know someone's an actual Christian. It's how do you feel, like let's for example, you might have really been a big drinker, then you give your life to Christ, and then you try to be a big drinker again, you're like, you just feel like you're taking Jesus drinking along with you, like you feel different. <laughs> you're like, it's not as if you don't do it, but you just have something almost that you're trying to reconcile with it. That is fruit that you've been born new. And we don't, we don't give our lives to Christ, or let me say this, we don't do good things just to try to win favor with Christ, and that's what makes everything so different in Christianity, is that other religions are trying to win points on the scoreboard. It's a free gift right there for you, and we don't do good things to get saved. We do good things because we are saved. That's right. It's completely different. different. We do it out of an act of worship and celebration, and I, I can say this. I'm not an expert in world religions, but I am an expert in American paganism. I am, because uh, I fight it every single day. Uh, and by the way, I, I love these pastors. Like, I don't want to be political. You don't realize we're fighting the pagan gods of the Old Testament every day. Yeah. We are fighting the pagan god of Molech. We're fighting the pagan god of Jezebel. We are fighting the pagan gods that God's chosen people were up against all the time. When I go to these college campuses, they are broken, they are suffering, mm -hmm. they're looking for eternal hope, mm -hmm. and only Jesus is that hope. Right. And if I can bring just you know, one person to Christ, I know there's one person I met earlier right. uh, that was just an amazing testimonial, um, then it's a life well lived, mm -hmm. and you get life eternal. Yeah. It's the greatest thing you can give to other people, and so praise God that uh, we get the chance to know Jesus Christ, and if you don't, uh, you should make that decision here tonight. It's the most important decision you can make. There you go. <laughs> The best, the best information you could have. And I often say, listen, you can be conservative and still on your way to hell. You need Christ. You need to be born again. That's what, that's what matters. You know, Charlie, I want to talk for a moment, just talking about um, our involvement in the church. And, you know, there's something lately that I've heard uh, more. Um, it's, it's, it's some titles that get thrown around, some, some things that the church is being called. It's the word Christian nationalist and dominionist. Can you help us understand? It's, 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 you can't get involved in anything civically because you're, all, you're a Christian nationalist. Can I break that down for us? Yeah. And help us to understand what, what is that about? I'm so, so glad you bring this up, uh, John. This is now the number one narrative that will be pushed forward by a secular pagan regime to try to get the church not involved in politics. Mm. Uh, they have now broadcasted it. They've done a movie. Uh, people that I grew up really respecting, I'm saddened by this, John, uh, and I, I, like people like Russell Moore, who I end up re reading a lot of his stuff, he's going in movies saying that Christian nationalism is this huge threat, and he's partnering with Sagan, uh, 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 secular pagan, I was going to say satanic, but that's probably true too, um, but true. Se secular pagans in making these films, you know, warning and cautioning about the growing threat of Christian nationalism, and I always joke around, I said, I've, tr I've spoken to over 150 churches across the country. Like, what, what exactly are you afraid of? Hmm. Are you afraid of all the poor people that they're helping or all the hungry people that they're feeding hmm. or all the marriages that they're saving, right? Are you afraid of all the people that are lost that now have direction because of the church? And what they're really afraid of is they're terrified that the Christian church might unite its political power and might be the no against the regime, and, and, and it yeah. is the conscious of the nation. And so, you know, I get asked all the time, are you a Christian nationalist? And I say, I don't like that term, I don't. I am a Christian and I am a nationalist, so I'm not afraid of that. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to call me a Nazi, okay? So let's just be as, I'm a blunt guy, if you don't know that. Um, <laughs> you're trying to call me a Nazi, and so I find that to be reprehensible and repulsive. I want a restoration of the Constitution, and that's what you want too. I want, I'm a constitutionalist, I'm a Bible-believing Christian constitutionalist. You know who else was? James Madison, and George Washington, and John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton. If I went around to everyone in this room, if I said, if we can restore the promise of the Constitution, would you be happy? You'd say, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the bad guys say, well, what are you so afraid of? Oh, I don't know, um, the church being deemed non-essential? When strip clubs and marijuana dispensaries 
and liquor stores could remain open and the church has to close forcibly and Easter and Pentecost are taken from us? Or I don't know, they go after our children and try, they try to chemically castrate them against their will. Where, where is the, did you shout them out earlier? The, um, the ballot referendum, that's so important by the way. Everyone's got a side in that ballot referendum. It's incredibly important here. And so I go back to the Bible and, and to scripture for all authority and for all guidance. If it's not in the Bible, then we got a problem, okay? So let's go to a couple of verses. Jeremiah 29, seven, seek or demand, it's the word badrash in Hebrew, the welfare of the nation that you are in because your welfare is tied to your nation's welfare. Mm-hmm. It is a commandment from the Lord as the prophet Jeremiah writes in the 29th book that you need to care about your nation. Daniel fasted and prayed for his nation. Esther cared for her nation. Mm-hmm. Mordecai cared for his nation. Jeremiah, not to mention um, Elijah, who didn't just care about his nation, he confronted King Ahab and was like, let's throw this down on Mount Carmel and see who the real God actually is. They would call him, Elijah, you're being too political. Elijah, how dare you confront the pagan forces? Why don't you just preach the gospel, Elijah? Why are you trying to throw it down on Mount Carmel? You're too confrontational. He did even more than that. If you, you could check it out. In, uh, in, I think you guys are studying First Kings. You'll get to that uh, pretty soon. So. Um, it wasn't, politi- wasn't politically correct. But they're using this as a way to try to make you feel radical and afraid. Okay? You must reject the premise in that sense. Kind of laugh at it and scoff at it and say, oh, you think I'm a Christian nationalist? Well, you're a pagan globalist. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Like you, you worship the fake pagan gods of child sacrifice and of child mutilation. You worship at the golden calf of money and pride and fame and social acceptance. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I want a restoration of what unites all different tribes of this country. Believing tribes and non-believing tribes. One thing that we can all agree on is that the promise of the Declaration and the Constitution is one that is biblical. It is based largely and primarily on the book of Deuteronomy. It is one that is eternal. It hearkens back to even the supreme judge of the world, which you know in Revelation is Jesus Christ, who sits on the throne and judges. You read the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. It is a prayer. Many people have not told you this before. There is a prayer in our founding documents. Oh, Charlie, don't you know the founding fathers were all secular? Well, okay, 55 out of 56 of the founding fathers were Bible-believing, church-attending Christians. But yes, maybe one of them was not you know, a Christian. Not to mention nine out of 13 of the original colonies at the, founding, at the uh, American founding had a requirement that you were a Bible-believing Christian to even serve in political office in nine out of 13 of those original co- uh, colonies. However, going back out of that, what we want at this time is for the Constitution to be restored, the church to never be deemed non-essential again, for our children to be off limits, that the separation between adult and child is firm and is non-negotiable, and we will never waver on that, that the distinctions between male and female will never be blurred. And let me just reiterate what I said earlier. The biblical role for a Christian in the church is not to make politics your everything. It surprises my critics when I say that because they don't listen to what I say. They put words in my mouth. I have never said that politics should be the only business of the church. I said you should care about it. Jesus needs to be the center of your church. But if you don't ever mention politics, if you don't ever mention what happens in your city, if you don't ever mention morality, you are failing your flock. And unfortunately, in today's time, the political band is growing and growing and growing because government is growing and growing and growing, so the threat to the church is growing. And are we going to be like the Christians in Nazi Germany that just sat idly by when the great horrors were continuing and the trains were bringing Jews to concentration camps? Well, we don't want to be political because of Romans 13. That's not who we as Christians are in this country. So they're going to try to silence us. They're going to try to make us seem as if you're bad or you're some sort of fascist because you want a restoration of the American promise. Reject the premise, keep scripture as the core, and I know the one thing that will unite us as a free society, which is a biblical society, is the constant Constitution and getting back to a constitutional republic. Love it. Great word. Great. You know, being, being a church leader and serving in a local congregation here in a community, why do you suppose that some church leaders, and you touched on it, are hesitant to take a stand against this flood tide of evil that we see coming in? What is it that stops them from being more bold 
about these things. And John, I have to brag on you. I'm very touched um, that you would continue to have me back to this church. It's not a joke. I mean, there are, some, there, there are pastors that have to resign because they get found out that they're fans of Turning Point and Charlie Kirk. There's one pastor in particular in Kansas. He uh, was fired because he wanted to screen, you know, Letter to the American Church, one of the movies uh, that we did here. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to applaud you, John. You're a real, you're a courageous person, and it, re ah. it really is great. And I mean that. And I, again, I, I don't consider what I say to be controversial. The world considers it to be controversial. That I consider what I say to be biblical and factual and mm -hmm. reasonable and rational. But look, look, John, let's be honest. The vast majority of people that call themselves pastors are not actually pastors. And I know that's a controversial thing to say. I believe a pastor is someone that has full spectrum involvement mm. in the ails of the world to try to bring Christ and the truth of the scriptures to wherever it's needed. Mm -hmm. That means to youth ministry, to prison ministries, to marriage ministries, whatever it is. And that also means to the public square. They look at being a pastor as you know, kind of a mixture between a motivational speak speaker and a TED talk. <laughs> um, and their churches have kind of become mm -hmm. like, I don't know, five ways to improve your happiness with good coffee and organized parking. <laughs> and and, and I, again, I'm not trying to overly insult, I'm trying to be a Bad, more, I, 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 I get these emails from these sweet people. Charlie, you shouldn't pick on pastors so much. It's just, I, I'll be honest, guys. I mean, I hold, this is where I disagree with it. I have three different uh, things of how I hold you to account. And the word judgment gets thrown around a lot. We are supposed to judge within the body, if, just so we're clear, okay? The, the, the world, I have a lot of, I have a heart for the lost. But here's the thing, if you, if on, on campus, if someone comes up to me, they say, I'm a Marxist atheist, I hold them to a much lower standard than someone who comes up to me and says, I'm a believer. When they say I'm a believer, I say, okay, now we're talking. Mm. And here's one of the reasons why. I, I, I'm, and then and the third is that, and then if you say you're a pastor, you're at a much, much, much higher standard. And don't take my word for it. I'll give you multiple biblical examples. The entire book of Titus is all about church governance. And if you're in the administration of the holy, you're held to a higher standard. Paul wrote extensively about the, those in the head of the church have different rules, different customs, different accountability measures. If you are going to be in charge of an ecclesia or a body, the entire book of Leviticus is about if you are a priest, if you are in the handling of the holy, different rules, different customs, different clothes, different garments. And so throughout the scriptures, it is screaming at us that if you're a pastor, it's just you're hold, held to a higher mm -hmm. standard. Yeah. And uh, let's, let's go back to the Ten Commandments. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Now that means verbally we should never say that, the, the, I don't like when people throw around, oh my, you know, I don't like it, I believe that to be a sin. But I believe it actually is deeper than that and it's not reading into it exegetically. The word is do not carry the Lord's name in vain. Uh, which you could interpret that in a lot of different ways. It is not too far to say, and the original rabbis would say this back 2,000, 3,000 years ago, which is that if you are going to do evil in the name of God, that is one of the most, that is the unforgivable thing you do. And if you really wrestle with that, it makes sense. Because, for example, if every pastor was an adulterer, it would destroy the faith. If every single, pa think about it, they pick one pastor out of a thousand and it makes us all look bad, right? Mm. Just think about one. They're able to they're misrepresent the entire body of Christ. And so when you are in the role and you say, I am a pastor, which by the way, I never say I'm a pastor. I'm not a theologian. I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, and I love the word, okay? But when someone says they're a pastor, we immediately need to hold them to higher account because they're now telling you that I am a spokesperson, an interlocutor, a, dare I say, mediator for the scriptures. Now, Christ is the ultimate mediator but they say that I'm here to help you understand this, and if they say something is blasphemous and is heretical, that well, the, 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 we don't do politics around here, we just do the gospel, then I believe you're gonna be judged for that kind of heresy. Yeah. I, 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 and I'm, I don't think you should only talk about politics, but you're trying to tell me God is indifferent to the one million abortions happening in this country every single year, and that he wants his church just to kind of, you know, sit, sit around and talk about how you know, they, they read Live, Eat, and Pray, or whatever that silly book is that, you know, more women would know than men, or whatever. Pray, Live, and Eat, I always get it wrong, whatever it is. I haven't um, read it, I don't know about And, and I, look, I look at some of these pastors, and I will say, I break them into different categories. Some of them, you know, they, they, they obviously have a much bigger wardrobe budget than a book budget, and I say, these guys have gotta resign from the ministry. They're not doing serious study or scholarship, and, but some I think are afraid. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll be honest, I've lost patience with them. I had patience with them for like during COVID. And now I say, if you are afraid as a pastor, go sell insurance. Stop being a pastor. You have no business. Only God, you should. By the way, nothing against insurance salesmen. We need you, please. I mean, I, I love you guys to death, True. okay? But I'm sure we have a couple here tonight that they aren't laughing at all at what I'm saying. That's not funny. That's not funny. That's <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, funny. But I'll, 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 I'll throw it back to you, John, with this. If you're going to step into the arena right now at the very consequential times we're living in, the signs of the times all around us, and you're going to say, I'm a pastor, and you want that because of the lifestyle or the Instagram clicks, or you think that it's like a cool job, I, I highly recommend you get out of the arena because you're doing more harm than good. Mm, thank you, Charlie. You know, I wonder as you, and just to kind of capitalize on that a little bit more, and I do agree with you. I think um, when you read through scripture, there were times when God would call prophets to confront kings and would put a word in their mouth, and it wasn't an easy word to deliver, and they weren't always applauded. And most times they were either imprisoned or they were put to death, they were hated, and I think there's the fear of man has taken above really the fear of God. And, and if, you fear, if you fear God, you don't have to fear anything. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, the fear of man. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. And, and I think it's important to have a greater reverence for God. I also would like to add, and maybe ask, ask you this, Charlie, do you think it's possible, because as a pastor, either, and it works in a couple different ways. You have people that say, A, you are too political. And then you have others that say, you're not political enough. And so you, as a pastor, you're, you know, you're, let's say you're ministering and you're doing all this, but people say, you don't say enough. I'm saying stuff. Like I'm, I, you know, it's not every week I'm going to like open the constitution to, I'm open the Bible, but I, if it comes up, you know, I, issues come up, we're going to talk about it. We can't be afraid of it, but I wonder, is it possible? Do you think it's possible to be to one side, is there, where's the, this is my question, and I really try to strike this, and you who attend here, you know my heart on this, I really try to strike the balance. I and I find the balance. John, if people say you aren't political enough, they're, they're wrong. And I, I, again, well, I feel better now. Thank well, you. I just look. I mean, I felt like no, maybe, but I mean, look. I mean, having me buys you like two years. Okay, that like, <laughs> that's like you, you bought like two years of you know inventory, and so. Um, but, but, but John, I mean, I, I, I watch you periodically. You're always speaking very morally clearly. I think Pastor Jack Hibbs does a great job yeah. of being great biblical job. and being outspoken. Great I think job. he does. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I try to watch Jack. I watch him almost every single week. But yes, of course you could become too political. So you watch Jack uh, every week and me like once in a while? Or? I'm sorry. It's, uh, I'll try to wrap that it's up. It's only cool. Man. I mean, I, I, you know. There's only so much time in a day. Sorry, go ahead. You were saying? I'm never going to be invited back, so now I'm really going to turn it up. Um, we love you, Jack. That's right. I, of course, I, I will say <laughs> Thanks, this. Thanks, Mom. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were saying. No, I, that's okay. I digress. Um, so I, of course, you could become too political, yeah. and this is... A, a, a friend of mine wrote a book, and I'm not going to say who he did because he has a great heart, and I met with him. He's a well-known theologian, and he became a friend through the book because I thought the book was totally off the mark. And he said one of the biggest problems is this rise of Christian nationalism. Mm. And the way he defines it, I actually tend to agree if that was the term, yeah. which was like, okay, the nation comes more important than Jesus. And, you know, that, okay, I said fine. But he thinks it's this widespread contagion. Yeah. And, I, and I said, no, it's not. You, you are, you are f like way misdiagnosing. Mm -hmm. There might be a fringe of the fringe. And I will tell you, again, yeah. I have, I've spoke at churches across the country. We have now had over 3,000 pastors pass through our training at TPUSA mm -hmm. Faith. I have not, hey, praise God, I huh? have not come, Exciting. it's amazing. I have awesome. not come across a pastor that I believe is too political. I have not, be, and, and I could, the evidence is this, because mm -hmm. I asked them, I say, Tell me about the most important metric. How many souls mm. are going to heaven? And they'll say, well, we've tripled our baptisms or quadrupled mm. you know, our attendance here in Easter. And, okay. So I mean, that, so I, I don't find it that way. I will say though, John, mm -hmm. okay, I, I grant you, there might be a church somewhere. And again, I will say, if they are too political, 
how have I not heard of them? I just, you know, <laughs> how have they not invited me to speak, right? Yeah. Like I just, I wanna find these people. Yeah, right. I'm sure they exist somewhere. Yeah. The much bigger problem though, John, is churches that are not political enough or not political at all. Yeah. And let's stop this word political. I, I, yeah, I, let me fix agreed. my language. They're not biblical enough there or they're not go. biblical at all. That's, that's the true it. problem, yeah, that's right? Yeah. And so, look, like that. The, there's a season for everything as it says in Ecclesiastes, right? So they're ramping things up in politics. It makes sense to have me speak here, right? But you gotta keep Jesus at the center. And John, you, I, I've known you for a little while and you always ask this question so well. And God will give you wisdom and he'll give it to you generously, right? And you're going through the scriptures and it speaks clearly to a moral topic. Hit it. And, and hey, if there's yeah. a breaking news item and you feel led, then you just dive into it, yeah. right? And that, that is what it means to lead the ecclesia and the public square, yeah. uh, which is what church actually means in the original Greek. Yeah. But the biggest problem right now in American Christianity, let's not fool ourselves, are pastors that do not dive into the current events and better yet, they do not equip their flock to be able to read the news items and understand what does the Bible say about trans surgeries? Yeah. What does the Bible say about immigration? What does the Bible say about uh, politicians? What does it say about government? Should we submit to government all the time? Is there ever a right time right. to rebel against government? And so what I have found is if the church, the flock, are not getting that kind of guidance from their church, they will go get it from a secular authority. And the tragedy of modern Christianity is you have millions of people going to church every single day, not being equipped with a biblical worldview. Right. See, a biblical worldview, uh, the best way I could put it is, it is the color of which you see everything. So once you get a biblical worldview taught by a good pastor like Pastor John and so on and so forth, um, is then you see a news item on CNN like, well, that doesn't harmonize with my worldview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're trained then in the ways, so you no longer need the pastor to guide you through every news item. And that kind of training takes time and you have to spend time in the scriptures and you have to read the Bible every day and you have to listen to Christian music and you have to pray to God and you develop that. It's a muscle set, really. And for new Christians, it might take a year or two or three or four or five because you might still be looking at it through the secular old worldview. And sometimes you need to kind of get those muscles back into action because sometimes you might be falling into kind of a secular way of thinking. But the, 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 so many pastors will then do something even worse than that is they'll take a secular new age worldview and bring it into the church. Mm -hmm. That's right. So let me give you an example. Yeah. yeah, please. Is they'll come up and they'll say, I don't like Donald Trump because he's not nice. And so then I say, find the word nice anywhere in the Bible and I will concede the, the point. It's nowhere in the 66 books of the Bible is the word nice. The word nice is from the 1900s. In Latin, it means stupid and so, no, it really does. It means ignorant, stupid, you wow. know, and like, you know, oh, that person's really nice, you know, like, and how it metamorphosized into what we, you know, mean now. Now you were supposed to be called to be kind, wow. loving, compassion, compassionate, long suffering, mm -hmm. truthful, all those things are correct. But they, they will say that, you know, I, I, I can't vote for this person or I can't support this candidate. I'm not here to make it all about Trump, but I'm just using an example, right? Or because, you know, I, I, I don't like the way that, you know, they, they say certain things. Okay. So you're trying to tell me that somebody's tone bothers you so much that you do not want Roe versus Wade to be repealed. Because if right, enough people right. thought the way you did in the 2016 presidential election with Hillary Clinton, we don't get Amy Coney Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch, and Roe versus Wade is still law of the land, and we would not have hundreds of thousands of lives be saved. So I, I praise God we didn't yeah, think yeah. that way. Facts. By the way, the embassy would never have been moved to Jerusalem and Israel. True. We wouldn't have had relative True. peace. We had a border for a short period of time. I could go on and on and yeah. on for other examples, right? Exactly. And so I, I, I want to make sure that pastors are not bringing these kind of secular prisms yeah. into the pulpit. I love that. Great word, Charlie. I love that. It's excellent. You know, probably on all of our minds, we've been counting down the days, uh, the years, You've seen it, I've seen it, it's painful to watch. We, you've seen the, the films that expose what happened during the election and it just fires you up even more. And all the false narratives and all the fake things that come out. Charlie, I, I know on the minds of, of these 
uh, freedom-loving people tonight is the election. We were talking uh, tonight before about some of the things that are going on and, and what you were sharing and I was listening I, I found encouraging. Talk about this upcoming election, how important this is, how critical this is, and what the church can be doing to make a difference so, well, you know, so the, this doesn't happen again. We got we to gotta do something. I, I love the question. And so I'm going to start unusually. I, I want to make sure that we all make a commitment that if this election doesn't go our way, the next day we fight. That's a very important thing. And I, I, I know I, I get golf applause because... A lot of people don't want to hear that. They say, what do you mean it doesn't go our way? It has to go our way. We have to win. I, I agree. But if, if your answer is, no, I'm not going to fight if I don't get my way, then you are a summer, sunny, what they called in the, the sunshine patriot, uh, not ready for the winter storm. And there were a lot of people, by the way, that were all on board for the American Revolution as long as it was 73 degrees and sunny. And as soon as they had to march through the... Uh, the winter and fight a smallpox epidemic. They said, forget this, you know, mm. liberty sounds nice, but I, I, like, I like the King George a lot. So they kind of got out of the way. So you have to commit yourself to that. Look, I'm a big supporter of President Trump. I, I think he's in a great position. Uh, I really do. And I'm gonna walk you through the numbers. And I, I hesitate, I, I really hesitate to say that because they, mark my words, put it in your phone. They got something planned for us and it's gonna be nasty and it will be asymmetric. And so if, if only elections aren't in mid-March, right? You know, if only it wasn't the Ides of March and we have elections, it would be great. How, how, how to best unpack this, John? It's gonna come down to a couple of states. Yeah. So let's go through this. I, I am 50-50 on whether Joe Biden will be the nominee. It looks like he will be the nominee, but anything can change. They're running out of time. If they were gonna do it, it probably would have already been done by now. You say, oh, it could be done after the convention. That's easier said than done. Uh, but I, I concede the point that very well could, that could be possible. Um, it's not Trump versus Biden. It's Trump versus Biden versus RFK versus Cornell West versus Jill Stein. Let me pivot yeah. for a second. If any of you are thinking of voting for RFK, stop it. Okay? <laughs> Enough of this. I, yes, I get please. So, yeah, share I, I get, with that. I, I get so many messages yeah. of this. Oh, Charlie, he's so handsome. What are you handsome? It's the crazy thing. You know, like, uh, uh, handsome. Like, what, what is this? I mean, I vote for Gavin Newsom, I guess. It's not, ugh. yeah. People, people message me all the time saying he's the most handsome politician in America. I said, this must be a troll, right? I say, I think he's like Bane from, from, Darth Va uh, from uh, uh, Batman or something. Um, so the uh, RFK, let me talk about this for a second. I, I had him on my program. He's completely ill-equipped to become president, okay? He he's a pro-abortion don't know where he stands on trans stuff, Massachusetts liberal, climate change guy, okay? You, you, you cannot vote for him, especially if you're a Bible-believing Christian. And I say this because he's pulling 16% of the vote, uh, which is a very significant figure. So it's Trump v. Biden v. RFK versus Cornell West versus Jill Stein, very similar to the 1992 presidential election mm -hmm. when Bill Clinton uh, ran against Herbert Walker, B Herbert Walker Bush with Ross Perot, um, and the winning candidate got 43% of the vote, Bill Clinton, who became president for two terms. It's going to come down to a handful of states. It's going to come down to Arizona, Georgia, and either Wisconsin, Michigan, or Pennsylvania. So Georgia, the Biden campaign is feeling... Uh, uh, let's just say continually very bad about Georgia, which is a good sign. They're very uh, bearish on the state of Georgia, so they're pulling out of Georgia. Go to Arizona, uh, that's where we're headquartered, it's where I live. Um, I don't wanna make any big proclamations. Our voting systems are so screwed up in Arizona, it is going to be a knife fight, it's gonna be a battle uh, to the bitter end. Uh, that thing is gonna come down to 5,000 votes, 6,000 votes. At Turning Point Action, uh, we are hiring the largest ballot chasing army in the history of Republican GOTV oh, politics. Come on. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we are hiring Exciting. over 350 full-time people. It is a massive endeavor. Somebody asked me earlier, they said, how many people work for you right now? I said, well, 500, soon to be 800. said, congratulations. I said, you mean your condolences. Uh, <laughs> hiring that many people is not easy, as any of you that have run big businesses know, vetting, all that sort of stuff. So keep us in prayer. Praise God, uh, we've raised a fair amount of resources to pay for it. Uh, we could always use more. Uh, not here to ask you guys for money. Um, I will ask you for prayer, but not money. Um, but the, the Lord has really blessed us financially to be able to get out of the gate. Uh, we're also doing something similar in Wisconsin. Over 150 people we're hiring in the state of Wisconsin. So it's all gonna... If you were to say, what does it come down to? Um, it comes down to Joe Biden has to win all three of what is called the blue wall. 
Donald Trump has to win one out of the blue wall, and that's it. If Donald Trump wins one out of the blue wall, he's president of the United States if he wins Arizona and Georgia. So it is Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Do you want me to keep going on this Please. granularity? Okay. I, I, I don't do. Know. I do. Yeah, Anybody okay. else? All right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, Helpful. Okay. Helpful. Thank you. Okay. So let's start with the one that I'm the least excited about, which is Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania is incredibly crooked. John Fetterman should not be a U.S. Senator. Um, even though he's becoming mysteriously right wing in like recent months, it's very strange, but he, he's, 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 still, he's still a Democrat. And they have mass mail-in voting, very crooked voting laws. Philadelphia is an awful yeah. city. I mean, Philadelphia is like LA, but just a little smaller as far as how corrupt it is, how backward it is. Yeah. New Jersey is right across the, the border and they have tons of crooked activity there. So Pennsylvania will be very tough. So then Michigan, Michigan I would be very bearish on, uh, but God works in mysterious ways. This uh, Israel-Gaza uh, war is really causing problems for the Democrats. If 100,000 Arab Muslims in Michigan decide to vote unaffiliated or not vote for the Democrat Party, Donald Trump could win the state of Michigan. He does very, very well in Michigan, especially with the muscular class, auto workers, Wayne County, Macomb County. He has a special attachment to the state of Michigan. So that, that's, that's still a tougher shot, but more achievable than Pennsylvania. Then in our opinion, it's all gonna come down to Wisconsin. Uh, we think Wisconsin is the most winnable of those three. It has um, poor voting laws, but the best of the three voting laws, because election integrity, I don't know if you guys agree, is like my number one issue. We need to secure our elections. I think oh, it yeah. is so incredibly important. And something that I got involved in very heavily, and we paid a personal price. They came after my family, they came after me personally, uh, as we went and we were successful, amongst other people, to get Ronna McRomney to resign from the RNC, and we were successful in that regard. And so there is a far improved regime now. Uh, Laura Trump is doing a great job. She's terrific, and I think very highly of her. There's still some problems there, but it is much, it is far better than it was uh, even a month ago. And so at Turning Point Action, we really made it a kind of our obsession yeah. to try to get RNC regime change. And uh, we got what we wanted, which was really great. We wanted it for the country. It was not some sort of petty grievance. It's just that that regime was not going to bring us forth victory. So it's going to come down to Wisconsin. Uh, if you go back to the 2020 election, uh, Donald Trump fell 21,000 votes short in the state of Wisconsin. And so every single ballot, every single voter is going to come down to it. So if the election was, how I think it's going to come down in uh, November is this. I think that Georgia and Arizona, at the current trend, we should be, if we do the work, okay. Arizona, again, I don't want to make any huge right. predictions because it's so crooked after what they did at Cary Lake. I'm not going to mm. overly predict. But we have to do our work. I, I'll tell you, we have not done the necessary work in Wisconsin yet. We are behind. Uh, they, have ton they have over 2,000 full-time Democrats on the ground in Wisconsin, uh, doing this work, chasing ballots, registering voters, and uh, it's gonna come down to that. And it's a big mystery of how the third party candidates are gonna play into it. And uh, so we, we have a lot of work to do. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a very tough uh, seven to eight months for those of us that are really involved in this. Uh, and, and make sure, I hope you guys understand this, and I think you do. This is a spiritual war, first and foremost. Yeah, that's right. uh, there are demons that are at work trying, the amount yeah. of asymmetric, uh, just say inexplicable nonsense that has happened to us and our team in the last 30 days, mm. the only explanation is demonic and that from the occult. And, and we know it because we are on the cutting edge. We have the largest staff that is doing this. We have the most dedicated team, the hardest working people. We're go, 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 almost no time off now till uh, when ballots are counted in November. Um, but you know, we, we live for this, John. You know, the Lord has blessed us with an incredible platform with millions of followers, over 300,000 people now give us money uh, and as small dollar donations, which is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been saying for a long time, Lord use us. Kind of our uh, mantra for the 2024 year is Hanani, here I am, uh, mm -hmm. which is used seven times throughout the Old Testament. Most famously, of course, with the binding of Isaac mm -hmm. uh, in the book of Genesis with Abraham and Isaac, but also uh, with uh, Moses when he sees the burning bush, here I am. Uh, Samuel, the call of Samuel, here I am. And it's this idea of, Lord, use me. 
And that is what should the mantra for all of us should be as the kind of core focus, which is, Lord, use me. How can you use me for your purposes to advance the kingdom of God here on earth? And so it's a full court press now, the November. Yeah, amen. Oh, it's great. I love that. Wow. So thankful. So thankful for the, the work that you're doing and, and all your efforts. I encourage you folks, if you believe in what's going on, and uh, to become a supporter. And I know you don't ask for money, and we're not asking for money. We never do that either. But if, if you believe in it and, and you uh, feel the Lord leading, I'd encourage you to consider that. I think it'd be a real blessing. Obviously, a great blessing, what you're doing. I also want to say, you know, as we talk about coming down to voting, this is a question. You and I dialogued a little bit about this before, but why... Do self-proclaiming Christians vote for candidates who are in opposition to a biblical worldview? Follow-up question, can you be a Democrat and still hold Christian values? Oh, this is for Charlie, by the way, just so. Thank you for Thank answering. You. Um, and I, I've said this before, and I want to make sure I'm very clear with my yeah, language, I okay? Know. appreciate that. If you cannot, in my personal opinion, be a true born again Christian, and vote Democrat in 2024. And, and, and highlight why that is. It's yeah, easy to say that, yes. but like break, drill down on that a little bit no, for us so you know. because And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean if you vote Republican, you're a Christian, okay? Let's just <laughs> be clear. That, that's not, the inverse is not true. Right. I'm making a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. So why is that yeah. the case? So a vote is your proxy, your statement to the state that these are my values, this is what I believe, okay? This is how we have to educate voting. So everything you do is watched and judged by God, and everything you do should be to the glory of God, okay? So everything you do, from what you eat, for who you marry, everything, how you talk. And when you vote, it's not insignificant, because as you vote, it is your communication saying, I as the sovereign are now giving you power so it's a transfer of power. You might not have thought it that way. Mm. When you fill out your ballot, it's a transfer of power. So you're basically saying, I want you to do what I would best do in that position, mm. the best fit and the best mold you can. There'll never be 100% fit. But if you say, I am a Christian and I would do what you do, you're basically saying, at the best, I'm indifferent. But in the current Democrat party, they're not indifferent. They are celebratory of a million abortions a year. Kamala Harris visited a child sacrificing center this last week mm. called Planned Parenthood. The first vice president or president ever to visit an abortion clinic. It, it, it is beyond disgusting. That alone should say, okay, you're a, bi you're, you're, a, you're a born again Christian and you're gonna vote for the political party that sends a vice president to an abortion clinic. Yeah. So let me just kind of go through three very simple, and I could go even deeper, I could go 10, I could go 20, I could go 30, but three irrefutable, bulletproof contrast items between the Democrat party and the Republican party that are recent, they are biblical, and they are clear, and you can use them with your friends, okay? God created men and women, male and female. The Republican Party holds that as a core pillar of their party. The Democrat Party does not believe that. They believe that gender is infinite, that you could change your gender, and in fact, we should teach your children that, and that they can get irreversible damage done to them and pharmacological agents, and that the transgender craze, if you oppose it, you're a hater, and that you are a terrible person. God created man and woman, that's number one. Number two. Of course, the life issue. The Republican Party, in the pillar of the platform, is a pro-life party. Is a party more than times than not, the people you send to Congress, the people you send to the Senate, the people that you send to the presidency are fighting for the unborn. Are they as pro-life as I would like them to be? No. But they are still fighting in the advancement of pro-life policies, defunding Planned Parenthood, pro-life judges, constitutional judges, that's number two. The Democrat Party celebrates abortion as if it is a moral good. Number three. The church can never be called non-essential again. The Democrat Party went around the country and locked down church after church after church. So those three things, the Republican Party was against lockdowns, was in favor of the church never being called non-essential. And so if you're a Christian and say, I am voting for the Democrat Party, you are then saying, I want a resurrection of the pagan god of Molech to come back to America. 
the pagan god of child sacrifice. And I know that might be too intense for some of you to hear. How is it any different than what the Aztecs did on the top of a temple when they drove a stake through a child's heart than what Planned Parenthood does every single day? How many abortions do you think there are in America every day? There are 3,000 abortions in America every single day. And we're just supposed to be indifferent, like, oh, you know, allow people to make whatever choices they want, you know, uh, it's not murder, it's just the female's choice. I'm not gonna subscribe to that political movement. As soon as the political movement refuses to be pro-life, I'm gonna go start a new one. I I will not allow the Republican Party to not be a pro-life movement, ever. And you shouldn't either. And that's why you should stay engaged and stay involved at every single corner, every turn. And so, and the final thing I'll say though, is just look at through the fruit and this is a little bit of a deeper argument, but I think you'll resonate with this, is that God is a God of stability, order, and distinction. Those are three, our God is a God of order, stability, and distinction. Satan, by definition, is an agent of chaos, deception, confusion, and turmoil. John 10, 10, the enemy has come to lie, steal, cheat, and destroy. I, Christ Jesus, have come to give life and life more abundantly. In the last four years of living under this Biden garbage, we have seen this country go in the direction of chaos, of tumult, of of being upended from within. And so some people say, but Charlie, what do the Democrats want? They want full and complete destruction of the United States of America. They do not want a better country. They do not want you to live in a better tomorrow. They wanna overwhelm the system and radically transform it, as Barack Obama said, is one of the last things he said before he got elected president. We are only a few days away from fundamentally transforming this country. Let me ask you a question. Do you fundamentally transform that which you love? Do you turn to your wife and say, I can't wait to fundamentally transform you? (laughs) You conserve that which you love. That is why we call ourselves conservatives, because we have gratitude and love for this country that we did not build, but we inherited thanks to the grace and the glory of God. They want to destroy it. It is a harder message to say, stop, no, don't do that. Stop, no, don't do that. No, you don't get free stuff. Wake up earlier. Stop doing weed. No, hands off your kids. But it is the moral and the righteous political movement to be on the side of. So to answer your question, no. If you vote Democrat as a Christian, I think you can, you can no longer call yourself a Christian. You have to call yourself something else. I do not think you could be a Christian and vote Democrat. Thank you for the answer. So listen, you got Democrat friends (laughs) claiming to be Christians, pray for them, witness to them graciously. Don't go into the office tomorrow, you pagan Molech worshiping (laughs) heathen dog. You need to fall on your knees. Or maybe if it works with some people, but, but listen, you need to like, no, that's you know. That's a great point. I mean, yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, and I know, and I, I appreciate your, um, you know, this, this is the pastoral side of, uh, hey, love Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself, but if you love them, then tell them the truth, right? Tell them the truth. Speak the truth in love, but speak the truth. The world wants you to say, hey, just love everybody. This is all inclusive. If you really love people, you tell them the truth. If you don't love them, you'll lie to them. They're lied to all the time. You tell them the truth, and that's going to make the difference. So, with love. You know, Charlie, we're almost out of time, but I, one of the things that, that came up by way of question and people sent us questions and what do you think? And I love the fact that you are um, reaching young people. You, if you've never seen what Charlie does on the college campuses, YouTube it, check it out. I look at him and I think, oh, I mean, he sets up this card table and he just lets people just, just say all kinds of vile things in his face and he just keeps it together. I'm like, I don't, I could not, I'd be like, come on. you know, he just sits there and takes it. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm like, wow. I said, Michelle, look at this. Look at, look at what this kid's saying. Oh, cover your ears on that part. And he just graciously does it. And it's like, drop the mic. And they look, they just walk away. Like they don't know what to say. And um, I appreciate that about you. And my question is this, and that's really how I heard about Charlie. If you didn't know this, he's actually my, my second favorite Charlie, my first Charlie is uh, my grandson. Uh, he's also Charlie James, Charlie James. We just found that out today, same name. But anyways, 
What do you think is the single biggest issue affecting this next generation, Charlie? I, I love it. And just, just so we're clear, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I would get very upset at all these people <laughs> that come and scream at me. It is evidence of the Holy Spirit oh, and being man. transformed from within. Because that, that is not my nature. Yeah. That is not my nature. It is not. Um, but it is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, Love, amen. joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. And I'm forgetting one, the self-control. Um, so <laughs> self-control uh, is uh, a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, so amen. praise God. Yeah. So l- we only have a couple minutes for this. H- here's the best way amen. I can answer that question. The biggest problem that young people are facing is they are the first generation to inherit a secular America and not a Christian America. Mm. And, and that is a, we could do a whole hour speech uh, on that. Yeah. And I was the last gasp, I was born in 1993, and I was raised in like the last moment of Christian America. And we are no longer in a Christian country. Uh, we are no longer the dominant view. We are now a minority view mm-hmm. in this country. We still have plenty of following and buildings and, you know, uh, let's just say membership, for lack of a better term. Uh, But we were always told that Christianity was the problem and that moderation and secularism is the answer. And just look, look how wrong that was. But I'll be honest, who is to blame for that? It was apathetic Christians that allowed America to become secular. It's that we almost bought the lie And it was a, think about how ferocious of a propaganda campaign it was. It was movie after movie that portrayed Christians as hypocritical and they cheat on their wife and they're money grubbing and they're, and you think about the archetype that was always painted in mass media and in culture and outside of the obvious moral failings of individuals, let's talk about societally. We now live in the most, young people are the most depressed, suicidal, alcohol addicted, generation in history, and they are the least religious generation in history. But I will close with this on this thought, John. I do think it's starting to change, and there was this profound moment, and I've been tracking this, and Mm. I know some of you may or may not uh, listen to Joe Rogan. I I actually really like him, and he he, there's been a big, there's been a big change in some of his public commentary recently. He recently had my friend James Lindsay on the program, who I think is amazing, and at the end of the podcast, three-hour podcast, my friend Patrice listened to it too. There's too much swearing. They swear the whole podcast. It drives me nuts. I can't stand swearing. I don't like being around swearing. I think swearing is intellectually lazy and sloppy. I don't like it at all. Um, and so if you're swearing, you should stop swearing. I have a whole theory on that. Um, be- <laughs> no, I have a theory on it because if you can't control your tongue, you can't control your flesh. Mm. So if you can't, it's that sense. It's that simple. Yeah. And so um, discipline your language, you'll discipline yeah. your action. Okay, so that's... Oh, there, that's my whole speech um, on that. It's good. But it's good. all of a sudden at the end, James, the, the, Joe Rogan, who is known as quote, and like, quote unquote as like a cool guy, secular atheist, and James Lindsay, who used to be a leader, who again is one of my best friends, who, a leader of the new atheist movement. He, he asks James Lindsay, were you ever wrong about something? And James Lindsay said, you know, I was wrong thinking that religious people were all these kind of goofy, superstitious ones and that religion was just a bunch of fairy tales. And he's like, I don't think it's a good thing how secular this country has become. Mm -hmm. And Joe Rogan interjects, and I'm paraphrasing, he's like, yeah, I agree. It's like, we we, we need some sort of a moral center in this country. We need something. Now, that's not them giving their life to the Lord yet, but you're starting to see people who love truth realize the implications and the necessity of God in this culture. Mm-hmm. And I have found on campus that it is far more effective to argue the necessity of God's existence mm-hmm. than anything else. Of what is going to replace God if you're just gonna, there's no such thing as an atheist. It, right. Something will fill that yeah, void. That's right. The LGBTQ God, the pleasure God, the money God, the anti-racism God, the earth-worshiping pagan God, Something will fill that void. Something will fill that. And so my advice to the next generation um, is, you know, embrace tradition. Wind back the clock. Go back to how actually people talked in the 1950s and 60s. You're not allowed to say that. Oh, you're a racist. Okay, there were actually some good things in the 50s and 60s. Like people were way more polite and we, less people had autism. And, you know, I don't know. Uh, it was like a more decent country and people were... Like they knew who their neighbor was. And it wasn't like a crazy thing to like walk into a neighbor's house and be like, how are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a little bit. Can I make you a meal? And we don't even talk to our neighbors. 
You know, kids used to go out and play. Now they go and look at their phone all day long. Like, I kind of miss that country. I don't know about you. Yeah. Like, I don't think it was all just like bitterness and resentment. Yeah. I think it was kind of cool when like, kids walked to class and they had a, a firearm around their back. Like, I think it was kind of cool. It was actually taught responsibility. It was like, that's a weapon. You better teach, you know, take it seriously. We didn't have school shootings back then, by the way. People brought guns to school, put them in a locker. It's funny how we had more guns around and there were less school shootings. Mm. Like, we didn't have a bunch of kids on benzodiazepines and Zoloft and Prozac. Zoloft and Prozac and SSRIs, and we didn't have the suicide epidemic. It was a better country in some ways. Some ways it wasn't. Obviously, we needed some adjustments to federal law against discrimination, but this kind of like whitewashing that our country was so evil and terrible in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I think it's actually created a fake reality, and I think the, the smart young people want to go back to embrace tradition. They want to go back to that kind of country. Mm -hmm. They want to go back to the country of private property ownership and having kids and getting traditionally married and going to church yeah. and you know, I don't know, opening doors for women and not believing men can give birth and not having to use pronouns in some sort of stupid HR terror Nazi campaign where they like indoctrinate you because you work for Goldman Sachs and you work, you know, use the wrong pronoun, they're gonna fire you. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't like that country. I don't like the direction that's going. And so um, I pray we can have a restoration of that, yeah. of the, the, the once, the once, um, rooted moral center, and I'm seeing a lot of hope for it, John. I am. Uh, I don't see a majority yet, but I see a remnant that is ready to fight. I see a remnant that is awakening. Uh, I will say that we've been doing this campus tour for quite a while. We cannot find rooms big enough to fit all the students that want to attend our campus events. We literally can't. Praise God. And I am... I am as blunt and as forthright on the gospel and on everything then as I am now. There's no like campus Charlie and church Charlie, it's just Charlie. Um, it's just across the board. Uh, tomorrow I'll be on campus at San Diego State University and you know, we'll probably draw seven, 800, 900 kids just passing by that wanna have conversations and talk. The support is greater than you could ever imagine everybody and so to answer your question, John, we have a generation that is drowning in the excesses of secular paganism and only Jesus Christ and Christianity is the answer. I pray we can throw him that lifeline. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other thing, uh, when we're going to wrap uh, this up, I, um, uh, and, and that is, uh, Charlie, is, is how can we, first of all, how can we be praying for you? And then um, I'm going to ask your pastor who's here tonight, good, good friend of mine, to come up and pray for you, and we're gonna pray together. Man, you're gonna go, you're gonna sail onto the campus tomorrow, brother. You're gonna like, the prayers are just gonna, and you're gonna be backed up, and we're gonna be praying for you. How can we be praying for you and your team? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, honestly, it's, uh, you know, Paul talks a lot about running the race. Um, we have not stopped as an organization. We've been super blessed. But since Mike Pence took the stage, and he announced 15 days to sow the spread, it has been four years of, I feel as if we have been going like 95 miles an hour and like the engine is overheating, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a choice. I, I don't have the luxury of like, oh, you know, I, I, I love, you know, the Christian family. You know, some of these people, Charlie, why don't you go take a month sabbatical? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, not happening this year. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you have to wheelchair me there, okay? And I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a sabbatical from the emergency room. Like I am not, I have not, in my personal opinion, I've not done what I've done these last years out of obedience to God to sow into this, to not see this fight through, right? Uh, I haven't. And let me be clear, a sabbatical is awfully attractive right now, right? Uh, I mean, it has been, you know, 330 speeches a year, three hours of radio a day, three hours of podcasting a day, managing 500 employees. I'm not saying this to have anyone oh. feel sorry for me, but, you know, it's a heavy burden at times, especially with the spiritual war. So if you guys could just pray for us, you know, on a regular basis, engage in that, um, fast for us where appropriate, that's way better than money. You know, the Lord has blessed us with money and he, can, he will continue to. Um, that's really where we could use yeah. the biggest help. And then one other way that you guys can help yeah. is some of you guys are already there and following us on the Charlie Kirk Show podcast page. It does help us a lot. We're under constant attack by the big tech companies. If you guys aren't already subscribed, you can take out your phone um, and subscribe to the Charlie Kirk Show podcast page. Um, I think they have a graphic or something they throw up. Um, and it helps us a lot. We do three podcasts a day. You can follow the QR code. If everyone would do that, it would really help us out. Um, and uh, yeah, John, are, are you in the way? John? No, I might. Okay, can you guys right see it all right? Yeah. 
and yeah. so on, all these things. I didn't mean to block. And I know it's a little silly, guys, but this, it's free of charge. My favorite word in the English language is earn. Uh, we'd love to earn uh, your ability to be a go-to news source. If you're worried about the election, if you have questions, we cover it extensively from every possible place, from a biblical worldview every day. Every day, we are bringing the Bible straight into the public arena, uh, and praise God, uh, the podcast has really Let's grown go. tremendously. Yes. So, well, that's good. Uh, okay, well, then I get to pray, and, uh, and uh, so I'm going to pray for you, Charlie, and um, oh, you can sit, because you're so tall, people won't be able to see me. And Greg, why don't you come up here with me? My buddy Greg's going to come up, Pastor Greg. Yeah. Good friend. And uh, so we're going to pray. Hey, buddy, let me give you a hug. I didn't Good to see you, John. Good All job, right. buddy. Yeah, thanks, bro. appreciate that. All right. Great, great friend. You guys, let's pray for this young man, all right, and his team. Let's hold him up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight. Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, for what you're doing in and through Charlie's life. Lord, we know it's not just him. There's a group, there's a remnant, Lord, of, of people that are alongside of him. And, and God, we pray that he would see this fight through, Lord, that you would strengthen him in the inner man. Lord, we pray for all of the engagements, everything that's on the horizon, all that he's doing. God, we pray that you would go before him. Lord, your word says that you are the master of breakthrough. Lord, we pray for breakthrough this year. Lord, in every way, Lord, we pray that the gospel would go forward. We pray that things would change in our nation. God, we pray that people would turn to you. We pray that Christians would get off the bench and into the game. Lord, we pray that pastors would stand up and be bold, proclaimers of truth, unashamed, unfearful, Lord. God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on our brother in greater measure. Bless him, his wife, his family, Lord. We lift them up to you. Lord, take us from this place, Lord. Help us to be bold. Help us to be light and salt in this world until you come again. Amen. And we ask this in the name of Jesus amen. and all God's people said. Amen. 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 We love you, brother. Amen. We love you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Charlie. How about another hand for Charlie? Thank you. Man. Praise God. Well, what a blessing, right? Man, so great to have you guys here tonight. I hope that you were encouraged, that you were inspired. I know I was. Hope you learned something too. I learned a little bit tonight, actually more than a little bit. Make sure you take advantage of that podcast. Listen to that. This is great information. You want a clear source. There's so much misinformation. These guys get it right. And I encourage you, uh, this will really help you and send it to somebody else. Let's continue to uh, see this thing through. Listen, guys, God bless you. Drive safely tonight. And thank you so much for being here. All right. Love you guys. God bless. Have a great night. Thank you for coming. <laughs>